victorious. I'm so thankful this morning that we are victorious in Jesus' name. I love the part of that song where it says, I'm living the best life. I'm living the blessed life. There's no better life than living for Jesus Christ this morning. I'm so thankful that we can gather in His house this morning. For all those that's tuning in with us this morning on live stream, thank you so much for joining us. And thank God for technology this morning. Because from the very own comfort of your home, you can still hear the Word of God and feel the presence of the Almighty King this morning. And we pray that everybody has stayed safe throughout this week with the inclement weather. And thankfully, we're on the end of things. And praise God for that. Uh, I am ready to be back to normal and excited to be back in church with everybody. But, you know, nevertheless, I'm so thankful Scripture tells us where two or three are gathered in His name. There he is in the midst as well. So this morning I want to encourage everyone that may be watching, all of our viewers at home, our home congregation, our guests. I just want to encourage you, grab your family, get around the cell phone, the tablet, whatever device you may have in your home, and gather with one another. Because never take it for granted, we're not promised tomorrow. And thank God we still have the freedom and the liberty to serve Jesus Christ this morning. I'll open us up today. With a word of prayer, we all need prayer in this time and season in which we are living. Uh, to all of our home folks, I hope that you are still being faithful to our 21 days of prayer and fasting. Uh, I know we are going through some bumps and through the roads, but that's quite all right. And thank God for trials and tribulations because it's through the times that our patience is tested is where we are made strong. And scripture tells me where I am weak, thank God He is still strong. So this morning... Uh, wherever you may be, uh, you may be at home, you may still be in your pajamas, and that's all right, but whatever your need may be, we have a God that is in heaven today that is alive and well. Uh, so as we go to prayer this morning, I encourage you, whatever you have going on in your life, just forget about it for the next little while and tune into what God has in store for this service and for your life this morning. God, we thank you for this morning. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity that we still have today. God, I never want to take for granted the freedom that we have to gather with one another. Lord, as the approaching of your coming is closer than it's ever been. Lord, I never want to forsake the assembly together, but I pray this morning. God, in the comfort of everybody's home as they are watching this live service, I pray, Lord, that the power of the Holy Ghost, God, will intervene in their homes, would intervene in their lives, God, as we are gathered in this sanctuary. I pray the presence of God would abound in this place. Lord, we may be bound and afflicted this morning, but where your mercy is and your grace is, I pray it would much more abound in our hearts today. And God, as the word of God goes forth today, I pray there would be someone that was lost and undone to find themselves in an altar of repentance today. God, given their hearts over you this morning. And Lord, we'll be careful to praise you for it all. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen and amen. I encourage everybody this morning, for the next little while, let's worship with our worship team and watch what God can do for you. Let's worship the Lord this morning.
why don't you lift up your voice and let God know that you are thankful to be a one God, apostolic, tongue-talking, holy, rolling saint of God. Come on, right where you're sitting this morning. You may be sitting in your bedroom. You may be in the living room. Why don't you stand to your feet? Why don't you clap your hands and lift up your voice and make a great shout of praise unto our God. I know it feels different this morning, but God's still the same. He said, where two or three are gathered together in his name, he said, I will be in the midst. Hallelujah. I'm thankful to have the opportunity uh, to be able to lift up God's great name this morning. I don't know about you, but he's been good to me. Come on, I said he's been good to me. I know we've been shut in for a few days, but God has been good to me. Thank you, God, for the technology that we have to be able to live stream to you and connect with you this morning. If you're tuning in with us, God bless you. Uh, we're so glad that you uh, chose to click on our, our link and our live feed and worship the Lord uh, uh, with us. And whether you've ever been here or not, we're thankful that you clicked on us this morning. And maybe a song, maybe a verse, uh, maybe a word will encourage you and uplift you. And that's what we hope to do. Uh, we are trying our very best. We have had some uh, live stream difficulties, but I, I promise you we've got people here that are working on it, and we're trying our best to give you the very best that we can. And so I hope as we're singing and playing and preaching today uh, that you'll just have church right where you're at because I believe God is going to speak to us and move on our behalf. I've missed you. I've missed gathering together with you in one mind and one accord, and uh, we're looking forward to being back together on Wednesday evening uh, at 7 p.m. And I hope that uh, you will join us. If you have your Bibles, maybe you have your uh, iPhone handy there and an iPad, or maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe you don't want to follow uh, after what I'm reading. I'll read it here to you. And I believe God wants to help us today. Uh, the book of Luke chapter 6, I'd like to read one verse uh, in our hearing. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Very familiar verse. If you've sat through uh, a service that they're looking forward to taking up an offering, uh, you've probably heard this verse before, and I, I want to read it to you. It says, Give, and it shall be given unto you good measure. That sounds good. Pressed down and shaken together and running over. Shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet, or with the same measure that you give, it shall be measured to you again. Let me read that one more time. Give, and it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, and men shall also give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet, withal it shall be measured to you again with the help of the Holy Ghost today and I hope you'll get behind me I want to preach on this subject a greater understanding of giving and receiving a greater understanding of giving and receiving if you'd like a greater understanding of giving and receiving I wish where you're at today you'd pray with me and ask God to bless and anoint his word today Father we love you Although we're not able to gather together in body today, thank you that we are connected through the form of technology that you have allowed us to have. And I pray today that every hearer of this word would be blessed, would be strengthened, would be convicted, would be uplifted. Whatever your spirit wants to do today, God, I pray if there's a broken-hearted individual watching this morning that you would mend that broken heart. I pray if there's a depressed individual tuning in today that by the time you get done with them that they're feeling the joy of the Holy Ghost giving them strength. God, we just ask that you would bless this today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Luke chapter 6 verse 38 as I've already read twice talks about giving. And not only giving but the principle of giving and receiving. And it tells us that if we are willing to give, we will be given the ability to receive. 
But not only just receive, but it says, uh, if you will give, it's going to come to you in a way that is powerful. Not an ordinary measure, but scripture says a good measure. And not only that, but it says it's going to come to you pressed down. That means it's going to come into a form that's all that it can fit because it's been compacted near and close together and shaken together and even running over. And if that wasn't enough, God said also, I'll use men to give into your bosom. That sounds like a good plan there. I think we should be givers. Then it makes this statement. For with the same measure that ye meet, with it shall be measured to you again. Or what you are willing to give is what God is willing to give back to you. Most of the time we hear this scripture preached in a financial standpoint. But if you look at the context, the book of Luke chapter 6, and I do believe this can be used for financial, for offerings, because I know that the principle, the law of giving and receiving is the same no matter what it touches. I've seen it over my life. To, I have given and God has given back to me. But Jesus is not speaking in this context about financial giving. He goes on and he tells us that we should love our neighbor and not only love our neighbor, but we should love our enemies. He's talking about giving unto those who maybe is not worthy of our giving. Luke 6 and 36 says this, Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. God ain't dealing with money here. He's dealing with mercy. Come on, He's not dealing with finances. He's dealing with forgiveness. He goes on to say, to judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. But he ends it by saying, forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. For what you measure out, God said, I'm going to measure it back to you. If you measure out judgment, you can expect to receive judgment. If you measure out condemnation, you can expect to receive condemnation. But if you measure out forgiveness, hallelujah, God said, I'm going to pour some forgiveness of mine back into your world. Touches on judgment. This is a, a popular topic among Christians today. As any time they feel convicted, they think they are being judged. And often they will use this verse in the book of Matthew 7 and 1. It says, judge not that ye be not judged. We must be careful. And I spoke about measurements and comparison last week. And I kind of want to piggyback on, on the back side of that. We must be careful having a judgmental attitude. We must be careful having a condemning attitude because there is a principle and there is a law that what we give out shall come back to us, but not in an ordinary manner. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. But it finishes in verse 2 and it kind of gives us some more insight. Didn't just say don't judge and that's the end of the manner. But it says, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. What Jesus is trying to tell us here is that if you're willing to judge somebody, you better be willing to live up to that same standard of judgment that you judge somebody else for. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. What you measure out will be measured back to you. The book of Matthew chapter 18, verse 21, Peter asked this question. He said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? 
and I forgive him. Do I need to do it seven times? But Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. You understand, Peter had a measuring tape. And I believe it was custom, not custom, to forgive a man seven times in one day in the New Testament. But I believe that Peter stretched out his measuring tape and said, Jesus, I'm willing to forgive somebody seven times a day. Do you think that's enough? Is that okay? But then Jesus looked to him and said, not only is it not enough, but it is 70 times too less because I measure with a different standard than you do, Peter. My form of measurement is not like a man's measurement for where you thought you were doing something great. By forgiving a man seven times a day, I'm here to tell you, Peter, you're 70 times under what I am willing to do and what I am calling you to do. I would dare say today that you and I's measurement of forgiveness of mercy and of grace is far less than that of what God is requiring of you and I to do. Then he told this story. After finishing telling him 70 times 7, he said, Pete, let me tell you a story. He said, let me tell you what the kingdom of heaven is like. It's like unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. Somebody say, that's a lot of money. He had a debt that was owed that he could not pay. Verse 25 says, but for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. This Lord said, sell everything. Sell your wife. Sell your children. Sell all you have. You got a debt that you got to pay. And I am expecting payment. But something happened. Scripture said that the servant fell down and worshipped him. Saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. A request was made by a debtor and it was this. I don't have the money, but if you got some mercy, I'll do whatever it takes to make sure that the money gets paid back to you. And verse 27 says, Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion. And it said he loosed him and forgave him the debt. Something happened in the Lord of this man. Compassion welled up in him. Mercy overcame him. Forgiveness got a hold of him. Grace was dripping from the top of his head down to his feet. And he said, there, here's before me is a man that has a debt to pay, but he has no means to pay it. I got two choices here. I can either execute judgment or I can show him the same mercy that I have been shown. Forgiveness for a man that had a debt. Just a few weeks ago, maybe it was a couple months ago, I went to an event that they had at one of our uh, local Christian schools and that I enjoyed, and I was up early enough after I left there to go get breakfast. Usually don't have that opportunity a whole lot. And so I was trying to pick, where could I go eat? So I passed by an establishment. I thought I'm not going to go there. And I passed by another establishment. And if you're anything like me, you pass the place that you're going to eat. And so you have to turn around and have to go all the way back to that place because you didn't pull in the parking lot the first time. And so that's what I've done. I 
Went into this place, been there several times, knew they had good breakfast food, and went in and ate by myself. You know, it's not, it's not a bad thing to eat by yourself. You don't always have to have a company with you. I'm okay with that. I've done that since I was young. I, I don't mind eating by myself. And so I sat down at the table. Waitress came in. What do you want? Well, I want bacon. I want bologna. I want sausage. I want two eggs, sunny side up. And do you got any of that brown gravy? Yeah, I got brown gravy. Let me get some biscuits and brown gravy as well. Needless to say, I had my coffee, I had my water, I had my spread, and I went to town. I consumed every bit that they had given me. And so I was sitting there, a friend came by, stopped by, didn't know he was there, talked to me for a little bit. Well, it came time for payment, Brother Keith, and it hit me. I looked over at the menu, cash only. Well, if you know anything about me, I don't carry much cash. And so I was sitting there in my mind thinking, how can I pay this bill if I have no cash? Called my wife. She didn't answer. So I, I just thought, here's what I'll do. I'll, I'll get the bill from the waitress. I'll uh, politely tell her that I don't have any money. And that I'll come back another time and I'll make payment to her. And so I went up to her. I said, hey, ma'am. I said, I'm, I'm looking for my check. She said, it's already been taken care of. I was reminded of the cross. I was guilty of that bill. I, I ate every drop of food. That was on my plate. I went into the place. My words and my actions made me accounted worthy to receive a bill that had been given to me. But my form of payment was not sufficient to what the debtor could take. And I thought about our sin on Calvary. Way before you and I we're accounted guilty because of our actions and, and because of our decisions. Before we came to a form of payment that, that, that we didn't have any price to pay, there was already a God that said, I'm going to go ahead and pay in advance for what you cannot afford already. I'm thankful for the mercy of those who we have owed debts to. We owed a debt of sin and the wages of our sin were death. But Jesus Christ said, I'm going to pay for that with a payment that's going to last from everlasting to everlasting. Your good works are not enough. Your money is not enough. Your words are not enough. But I'm going to shed my precious blood and I'm going to give you mercy for what you owe extended mercy but this same man scripture Matthew 18 says he went out after being forgiven and he found one of his fellow servants which owed him a hundred pence he owed this man ten thousand talents and was forgiven but yet he found a man in his own life that owed him just a little bit of money. Look what he said. Pay me after he had laid hands on him. Not only that, but he took him by the throat. And he said, pay me that thou owest. And the fellow servant fell down in his feet and besought him saying, Have patience with me and I will pay thee all. This man took the same form of action the other feller did. Remember, he fell down at his Lord's feet and asked for patience that he'd pay him all. But yet when a man who owed him money was down on his hands and knees begging him for mercy and for time, he looked at him and he said these words. But he would not. He said no. And he went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. This reminds me of the story of you and I. If we think back over the entirety of our life, every time, every moment 
that we knew that we could not forgive ourselves. We knew that we had a debt to pay and we couldn't pay it. But when we besought the master and we fell at his feet and said, God, I'm asking that you would show me just a little bit of mercy. I'm in need of forgiveness. I've messed up again, God. I've went back on my word. I've lied. I've cheated. I've went back to things you already had forgiven me for. And I know, God, it was my decision. It was my choice. It was my words. But I'm asking you, if you'll just forgive me, I'll make it all right. And everyone in this room and watching should be able to testify that every time we got up from our knees, it was because of God lifted us up and said, it's okay, my son. My grace is sufficient for thee. My mercy is sufficient for thee. We left forgiven. We left free. We left justified. We left saved from the hands of our tormentor in the hands of our oppressor. But we run into individuals in our life. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a friend. Somebody who owes us for what they've done to us. Maybe it was a time they stabbed you in the back. Maybe they owe you physical money. Maybe they've talked about you. Maybe they've done you dirty. All these things. Yet when we stand before them, And they come to us and they ask us, I've messed up, I've made a mistake, I'm sorry. We do not show them the same mercy that has been given unto us. It's different when we're seated in the judgment seat. When we're standing before the judge, we're asking for mercy. But when we're sitting in the judgment seat, we go back to that same verse that says, For what measure ye judge, ye shall be judged by. The only way that a judge can be just is to live by the same law that he enforces. If we are going to live the way Christ has called us to live, we're going to have to be consistent. We're going to have to measure up to the same measure and stick that we use for everybody else around us. Look what happened. When his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant even as I had pity on thee? And the Lord was wroth. And delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. Then Jesus finishes this parable by saying, So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Can I tell you, it is the will of God to exercise forgiveness when your brother or sister comes to you and asks, for mercy you are required by the word of God to give mercy and I know it's hard I know it's difficult I've been there I have those feelings I have those thoughts but Jesus said you gotta be merciful as my father is merciful what are you gonna do preacher pastor you gonna excuse sin Absolutely not. I'm not here to advocate for excusing sin, but I'm here to advocate for extending mercy. Mercy, mercy, mercy. Blessed are those. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Do you want to be a recipient of mercy on that great day of judgment when you have an opportunity to show it? Show mercy unto those who need it. Jesus detailed in the book of Matthew chapter 6 verse 12 as he was teaching his disciples to pray. I find it no coincidence that in intermingled into this prayer was this verse. And forgive us our debts. 
hallelujah, as we forgive our debtors. It works hand in hand. There can be no forgiveness for our debts if we choose to resist forgiveness to our debtors. You had a debt to pay. I had a debt to pay. But there was a man that stepped in and said, I'll give you mercy. I'll give you love. It was on to say, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Why do they deserve my forgiveness? So you can earn God's. Why should I tell them it's okay? Why should I give them forgiveness? Because if you're willing to put your pride on the back burner and push away the thoughts of unforgiveness, Jesus said, I'll give you the same forgiveness that you measure out to others. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses trying to tell somebody today we got to be careful we must be careful we must be careful with the measurement that we use if you're going to have a measuring stick in your back pocket you better use it for yourself Come on, if you're going to measure everybody else by the same tape you better use that same tape on yourself Come on, we, we, we can't come to others because here's what's going to happen I'll tell you what happens when we judge others for something they're doing in their life and then when we do the same thing, we have held ourselves as guilty. Not because God's judgment, but because of yours. So you, in simple terms, have went from innocent to guilty because of the judgment that you have laid on others. Scripture tells us throughout that God is going to judge us. Let Him be the judge. Sure, we got to line up with this word. We know what it says. We go to those in the church who's living in sin to try to help save their soul according to the word of God. But over and over and over and over, at the end of this book, we're going to all have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And if we want God's mercy to override His judgment, we must extend that same mercy to others I love the book of Psalms chapter 30 verse 5 look what it says it says for his anger endureth but a moment I know they made you angry but think about how many times that you've made God angry think about how many times that you've went back on vows that you've given him You've done things that you know he's told you not to do. But scripture says that his measuring stick for his anger is but for a moment. But it goes on to say in the book of Psalms 118. Oh give thanks unto the Lord for he is good because his mercy endureth forever. He said, I got a measuring stick on my anger. It's but for a moment. But there's not a measuring tape in this entire world that can measure my mercy because it endures from generation to generation, from everlasting unto everlasting. And if you and I have a measuring tape for our mercy, we need to throw it out the back door. You know why? Because if we measure day in and day out, it still will not be big and long enough to measure up for the mercy that Jesus Christ has given us. So I say to you where you're sitting today, by the help of God, forgive. By the help of God, give mercy. By the help of God, make up your mind. I'm not going to live a life of unforgiveness and anger and malice and rebuke. I want to live a life filled with mercy. Because I want to be forgiven. As Dave has Peter is writing this, telling Jesus this. You can imagine. He thought he was doing good. Jesus, I'm seven times. Oh no, Peter. 490 times. 
They come to you 490 times in a day asking for your forgiveness. You've got to forgive them. But I bet Peter had a different way of thinking when he was out fishing on a boat. And they heard a voice coming from the seashore. Have you caught any fish? No. Cast your net on the other side. They threw their net on the other side of the boat. There was a huge multitude of fish that came under their net as they began to drag it in. And John, the one whom Jesus loved, uttered these words. It is the Lord. The Bible says Peter took his jacket or whatever he was wearing. He took it off, threw it away. He dove into the water and he began to swim towards that voice because he knew that if Jesus showed up, there was mercy for him. I'm thankful that in the midst of my sin, I had a Savior that was still willing to show up living in sin living in degradation living in a backslidden state but a voice came from the shore and said I'm here to give you some mercy Peter I'm here to extend you mercy but why did he need mercy? because as he was there when Jesus had been taken from the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus had said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. No, 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 Lord, not me. Not me. I... But when that rooster crew, three times... Three times he'd went back on his word. Three times he'd acted like the old Peter. Three times he'd went against God's commandment. Three times he failed. He left sorrowful, crying with tears in his eyes. I bet as he was, he left that area, he had a different perspective of mercy. Because for once in his life, outside when Jesus called him from that seashore, he was in need of mercy again. I bet he was thankful. Thank God you said 490 times, I just got three. Thank God, Jesus, I know your attitude towards sinners because I've messed up and I found myself in the same shape. I bet you that changed his life for eternity because for once in his life, he understood the importance of forgiveness and of mercy and of grace. He understood that as he messed up, there's gonna be a lot of people in his world that's gonna talk about him, gonna go against God word but as Jesus forgave him he knew so must I forgive those who have hurt me the next time somebody hurts you and you can't forgive them I want you to think back to the countless times you've had tears running down your eyes fell in a floor fell in an altar begging God to show you mercy and what did he do he extended it every single time Time. Remember that the next time you're harboring unforgiveness and hate and malice in your heart, remember what Jesus gave you. He gave you forgiveness. He gave you love. He gave you mercy. And I'm trying to make somebody understand in this house that if you're going to be willing to sit in the judgment seat, you must live by the same law that you enforce on everybody around you. And not only here, but when you stand before that judgment seat of Christ, the book of James chapter 2 and 13 says that mercy rejoiceth against judgment. What does that mean? That means if you've lived a life of mercy of showing mercy, of living by mercy, of giving others mercy that you didn't think deserves it. When you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, that same mercy that you have given to others, God is going to take that mercy and He's going to reapply it back to your life. Not only apply it, but He said, give me that forgiveness. Give me that mercy. Give me that grace that you gave 
I'm going to give it back to you. Good measure. Press down. Shaken together. Run it over. And men shall give into your bosom. Do you want forgiveness overflowing in your life? Let it overflow to others. Do you want mercy overflowing in your life? You got to let it flow to others. Do you want grace abounds over sin in your world? Every time somebody sins against you, let grace abound in their direction. I want to be... consumed by the love of God in my life good measure good measure let's give forgiveness let's give mercy let's give grace let's give it because God said if you'll give it I'll give it back to you not just financially but I want to show you mercy I want to show you grace I want to show you forgiveness where you're at today I don't know what you have going on Maybe somebody's hurt you or maybe you are guilty as I have been of sitting in the seat of judgment. But when it comes time that you mess up, you want things different. It's one thing I've learned since I've been pastoring and no, I don't make all the right decisions. I, I try my best. Even a decision as simple as Canceling this weekend was so tough on me, so hard. One thing that I have learned in my short span of pastoring is that Paul was writing to Timothy. He said, Tim, I want you to be instant in season and out of season. I want you to reprove. I want you to get on to it. Tell them when they're messing up. Tell them when they've done wrong. Rebuke them when they mess up. Rebuke them when they're living a life that don't match up to the world. Don't forget to exhort them. Encourage them. And this word smack dab in the middle of that. It says with all long suffering. Long suffering. All long suffering. Think about it. Think about it where you're at today. How long was it before you were saved? 10 years, 20, 30, 40, 50 years? How long did God suffer with your rebellion, with your sin, with your unforgiveness, with your anger? How long did He suffer? Maybe He's still suffering today. Maybe you're living an unrepented life. Maybe you're living a life of sin. Or maybe you've walked away from God. Maybe you're living smack dab in just a bunch of mistakes and don't know how you got there. He suffered this long with you so you can reach the point in your life where you fall down as that servant did before his master. And you say, Jesus... I don't have a payment that's great enough for my debt. But if you'll just show me some mercy, if you'll just show me some grace, I'll do everything I can from this moment forward to show you that I want to live a life that's pleasing and acceptable to you. Say a prayer today where you're at. Get down on your knees. He said, if you'll call unto Him, If you'll confess yourself to Him, He's faithful and He's just to forgive you. Maybe you are a born-again Christian, a born-again believer. But there's somebody in your world that you can't let the hurt and the pain away. It's consumed you. Think back to that cross, my friend. Think back when you needed the mercy of God. He didn't reject you. He didn't throw you away. He said, I'll pay that debt. I'll pay that price. Another part of scripture, and I'm closing, says this. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I'll repay it. What could he be talking about there? I 
know they're not worthy of your forgiveness, but give it to them anyway, and I'll repay you on that great day of judgment. Give them mercy, and I'll pay it back to you. I'll pour it out on your head. When you stand before me on that great day, I will show you my mercy and love. I encourage you today. Let this be a word that changes you. Let this be a word that transforms your life. Throw the measuring tape away. I'm not going to measure my mercy anymore. Because if there's no measuring tape for your mercy, there never reaches a point in your life where you said, I've given too much. I've forgiven too much. I've given too much grace. I've given too much mercy. But my friend, let me remind you in this moment, every one of us need to hear this. Every one of us needs to grab onto this word and say, I will not measure. I will not measure my mercy. I will not measure my forgiveness. I want to be like Jesus. I want to forgive. Thank you today. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for worshiping the Lord with us today. I'm looking so forward to being in service with you this Wednesday at 7 p.m. Be here early if you'd like to. You should have everything good and ready to go. If something changes, I will definitely let you know. But pray for me. Pray for the church. Pray one for another. Pray for revival. I hope you're still continuing your 21 days of prayer and fasting. I know it's been tough. Those brownies in the cabinet that you were fasting, they... They got to looking more and more delicious as the snowy days went by. But I know God honors our commitment. I know God honors even when we mess up, don't keep our commitment. I'm encouraging you today, come back Wednesday night with a great expectation of revival. Brother Hunter Gibson's going to be back Sunday night with us. Maybe we're going to get him. I've been trying for weeks to get him. But the snow keeps blowing in. And so I want to see you here. I want to see you here worshiping. And I hope you'll be blessed throughout this week. And uh, thank you so much for, for, for tuning in. God bless you. We love you. Thank you for tuning in to the Gospel Tabernacle. We dismiss in Jesus' name.